morning. It's good to see everybody here. We are doing a little bit different on our services today. So I'm going to start with a couple announcements and then we're going to do our memory verse. Now this evening at five o'clock we have a business meeting here at the church to approve our budget, uh, which there are copies of the budget on the back visitors booth if you have not gotten one yet. And we would encourage you to ask questions ahead of the business meeting so we can move it as long as quick as possible. And then Miss Jill has a Bible study starting. It's called We Over Me on October 8th. There's a sign up sheet on the back. You can sign up through uh, the website. If you have any questions, please see her. So let's go ahead and stand. We're going to do our memory verse. Uh, and then after the memory verse, we will remain standing for uh, some praise songs. So if you would join with me. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 34, 18. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for these words and how you are a comfort in God. That you know the downfalls, the uplifting of your people. I pray that you would encourage those that are brokenhearted and, and downcast today, that you would encourage them through the word of God, through your spirit, through the songs that will be sung, through encouragement through one another. Thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing. Well, good morning. Let's open up our service with And Can It Be.
standing, please. This morning our scripture reading is found in Romans chapter 3 by the Apostle Paul, and he speaks about justification by faith. And it starts in verse 21, and we're reading verses 21 through 30. And it says, But now apart from the law of righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and a justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? Is it excluded? By what kind of law, of works? But by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he only the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify and circumcise the faith of the uncircumcised through faith is one. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Would everyone please stand and join us?
Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Did you ever have one of those days? How many have had one of those days today? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. It just seemed like uh, I'm anticipating something good happening today because it seems like uh, Satan has just been trying to do everything to throw a monkey wrench into everything that we are trying to do. And you say, well, what are you trying to do? We're trying to give honor and glory to Jesus Christ in everything we do. And it's not always easy because we are in a spiritual battle and we must remember that. Now this morning we are going to be partaking in the Lord's table. And before we get to that, I would like us to return once more to the text that we have been studying over the past few weeks. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible or follow along on the screen, we're reading from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. Paul writes and says, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you this morning, as we have sung your praises this morning, and our theme has been our redemption and the satisfaction of the justice of God so that we may one day stand before you. As Paul wrote, that Jesus Christ was both the just and the justifier of those who believe by faith. Lord, as we come to partake and to remember your substitutionary death on that cross for us, and as we remember that you are coming back, this is our hope. This is our desire. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, as we've noted over the last couple of weeks, the main theme of this particular passage of Scripture is found in verse number 7. And it says that the Lord shall be revealed. He is coming. He will reveal. Remember, the first time he came, he did not reveal himself. He came as a babe. They were not looking for him. They were not expecting him. They were looking for Messiah to come and overthrow Rome and set up his kingdom. But he came meek and lowly. But when he comes again, he will come as king of kings and lord of lords. And so this text focuses on the second coming of Jesus Christ when he will come to set up his kingdom. And we also learn that when Jesus returns, there will be a twofold effect 
concerning his return. Two things will happen. First of all, he will grant relief to those who have their faith and trust in him. And then second of all, he will give retribution, which means to punish, full vengeance, wrath, curse, and condemn to those who have afflicted, those who believe in Christ. Now, we have been looking at this retribution the last couple of weeks, and the day of grace of which we are living in now will end in judgment. And it will be a judgment that streaks across this world, sweeps across this world. And we've asked three questions. Question number one is, why? Why retribution? And Paul tells us that it is only just. The Lord must carry out justice so that he will not violate his nature. God is just in everything that he does. You ever heard people say, God's not fair? Have you ever said it? Yeah, a couple of you are going, mm, yeah. Well, God isn't fair. The Bible doesn't teach that God is fair. It teaches that he is just. You know, fair is kind of a subjective thing, right? What may be fair to you may not be fair to me. But God will absolutely be just in everything that he does. No one will be able to point a finger at God and say, that's not right. Because he does all things right and good and well. The second question that we ask is who? Who is going to face this retribution that is coming? And we said that there are three delineations to this. First of all, the scripture tells us those who afflict God's people. And although we don't know exactly what that affliction entails, whether it is just a hatred for Christianity or a mockery or throwing into prison or losing a job or even being murdered for Christ, those who afflict, those who believe will face this retribution. And then those who do not know God. And it's not a matter of knowing about God. It is knowing God in a close, intimate relationship through Jesus Christ as not only your Savior, but as your Lord. And then third of all, those who disobey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is a command. Paul on Mars Hill said, God has commanded that all men everywhere are to repent, believe. It's a commanding sentence. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who disobey the gospel, and by the way, the good news of the gospel is the only way that a person enters into heaven, they will face the retribution of God. Paul says these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. Let that thought sink in for a moment. It's not temporary. You know, some people want to teach that uh, you go to a place and, and it's like a holding zone for you. Um, you know, we could probably relate to it. You know, if you leave your house, you got to be quarantined for two weeks or whatever and, and to make sure that everything's okay. And some people teach that about going to heaven. You know, you got to be quarantined for a while until you get fit for heaven or somebody prays you out or whatever the case may be. Scripture does not teach that. He says these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And then the third question we ask is how? They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction in two ways. First of all, the loss of the presence of God, the Lord. You say, well, what, what the deal does that make? I mean, what, what's so big about that? Well, you understand 
that everything good that we experience in this life, any human being, any beauty, any relationship, any joy, any love, is because of the presence of God in this world. And when that is removed, those who face this eternal destruction will face only the wickedness and the evil and the guilt of their sin and the weight of their rejection of Jesus Christ. And then the loss of the glory of his power. There is no hope. There is no second chance. There is nothing that can be done once you cross that line except to face the retribution of God. But there's a second aspect that we want to begin looking at this morning. And that's the aspect of relief. When he comes, he will bring relief. And the word relief, as we saw on the other slide, means rest or refreshment, uh, restoration. Now, when you talk about relief in Scripture, there are three kinds of of rest or relief that is promised by God. The first kind is salvation rest. Salvation rest. Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What does Jesus speak of here? He is speaking to Jews, and he knew the heavy burden that they bore in trying to keep the law in order for them to make it into the kingdom, so to speak. And he is telling them, you cannot keep the law. You cannot obey completely. There is only one way for you to find that rest, and that is to come to me, and I will give you that rest. And that's the way it is today, folks. People are trying so many things, trying to be good enough, to get to heaven. Have you ever witnessed to somebody and, 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 and you're talking to them about their need and they'll go, but I'm a good person. Man, I'm a good person. I pay my taxes. I treat my family right. I don't kick the dog much. I, I, I'm a good person. Listen, it's not a matter of how good you are. You cannot be good enough. We are born with a sin nature, and that sin separates us from God. Religion tells people, do this, do that, and everything will be okay. As long as your good works outweigh your bad works and you put in the balances, no! Jesus said it this way to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. Period. No one can be good enough, but the truth is no one can meet the oppressing impossibility of doing enough righteous works to earn salvation. And so Jesus says, you can't do it. Come unto me and I will give you rest. What a great invitation. We strive so hard so much and try to do so many things on our own. And Christ says, come and I'll give you rest. I'll give you salvation as a free gift. I'll give it to you by my grace. You don't have to earn it. I will take the burden. And my friends, that is salvation rest. And so in a way, we've already experienced some relief, right? You see, rest from any effort to earn salvation. When you enter into salvation rest, you are at rest from the works. You are at rest from your 
fruitless, useless, righteous efforts to save yourself. But that's not what the Apostle Paul has in mind here when he's talking about relief. He's talking about two things, more. The second one is millennial rest. Millennial rest. And millennial rest is this, is when the future, when Christ comes back to set up his kingdom, and in his kingdom there will be relief and rest. I've been reading in my devotions from Chronicles. And there's some good stuff in there, and there's some stuff when you get into the uh, genealogies and all of that, and who the soldiers were, and where they guarded, and all of those things. It, it kind of, you know, it gets a little taxing. But when Solomon comes along, and he says, or God says to Solomon, I am going to sit someone on the throne of David who will reign and rule from his throne forever and forever. He's talking about that millennial rest, that kingdom rest. Apostle Peter says in Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you. This is the rest that the Old Testament prophets talked about where they talked about that the lion was going to lay down with the lamb and that uh, they were going to beat their uh, swords into plowshares and, and babies would sit and play with uh, poisonous snakes and they would not hurt them. And every man will have his home and every man his vineyard and he will rest and relax and enjoy the presence of the Lord. That's pretty good, isn't it? But there's something better. That's eternal rest. Eternal rest. Revelation 14, 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow with Eternal rest. When you die, you enter into eternal rest. You can talk to some of our senior citizens, not including me. And the one thing they talk about, especially when uh, Al and Ken and Arvid get together, can't wait till Jesus comes back. Can't wait to get out of this life. Can't wait to get out of this body. Can't wait to go home. Can't wait to enter into my rest. Why are they so excited about that? Because of the eternal rest. They rest from any effort to gain salvation. You're resting from any battle with sin, from any struggles with temptation, from any fights through your trials, away from all of your sorrows and diseases. It's eternal bliss forevermore. So what Paul is saying here is when Jesus comes, we will enter into eternal rest. You say, what does eternal rest mean? Forever and forever and forever and forever. Ad nauseum. Pure bliss. And so as we get back to our text, this brings to mind, well, what about this relief? And we're just going to use the same three questions that we use for the retribution. And the first one is, why? Why will we enter into this rest? Why would Jesus return 
to bring relief and be so kind and gracious to people like us who are unworthy sinners, why such a great eternal reward awaits all those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Why would he do something like that? I mean, I know me. I wouldn't do that for me. But Christ did. And the answer is found again in verse number 6. For after all, it is only just for God to repay affliction to those who afflict you. It's only what? Just. We're back to the same answer. It is the justice of God that allows us to enter into heaven. That's what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous or just, as the authorized version says, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Your eternal reward is a matter of divine justice. He honors us with this grace and this reward because it is right for God to do that. It is just. Now understand, the justice of God is is not something that is very easy to understand. It, it kind of conflicts with us. Why is it just for God to send sinners to hell and, and just for God to, to, to forgive us? That doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem, dare I use the word, fair? Well, I've looked to someone who might be able to help us to understand this. A.W. Tozer, great theologian, great writer. And he says this about God and justice. He says, justice when used of God is a name we give to the way God is. And nothing more. And when God acts justly, he is not doing so to conform to an independent criterion, but simply acting like himself in a given situation. You see, I thought you said this was going to clear things up. What he's saying is, God is just, right? And whatever God does is just because he's God. And because he's God, whatever he does is just. It is in his nature. You see, he is just because he defines what justice is. He does not look to some outside source like the Ten Commandments or uh, any of those other things that we want to define justice as. He defines justice by what he does. Tozer goes on to say, As gold is an element in itself and can never change nor compromise, but is gold wherever it is found, so God is God always. Only fully God, and he can never be other than he is. Everything in the universe is good to the degree that it conforms to the nature of God and evil as it fails to do so. God is his own self-existent principle of moral equity, and when he sentences evil men or rewards the righteous, he simply acts like himself from within, uninfluenced by anything that is not himself. Oh, Pastor Dave, it's getting more clear. You see, when we try to describe God's attributes, we, we try to divide them up like a pie, right? 
we say, okay, so he's just, he's merciful, he's gracious, uh, he's long-suffering, he's all-knowing, and we divide it up by a pie. So when you divide the pie up, what do you do? You usually take a piece out and eat it, right? Or two. And so we try to separate the attributes of God into all of these different things. And in a way, we have to do that so that we can study him and have some understanding. But God is not like a pie. His attributes never contradict one another and never go against. He is one God, and they are all there together. So that you cannot separate his justice from his mercy, his grace from his wrath. Because he is God. And I know it sounds deep, but it really is simple. God sets his own standard, and whatever standard he sets is right for justice. He says, I will punish the unrighteous, the ungodly, because it is just. Because I am the standard for what is just. And I will reward the righteous because that also is just. You say, now wait a minute, Pastor Dave. Still not getting it. It's just for him to punish the unrighteous and just for him to reward the righteous. But I thought we were all sinners. That's right. That's right, we are. You see, how can God be just and merciful at the same time? As we said, his attributes are never in conflict. He is one and can act justly and still be in perfect harmony with his mercy. Tozer goes on. I know I get the look. Oh, boy. It is through the work of Christ in atonement. Justice is not violated, but satisfied. Redemptive theology teaches that mercy does not become effective towards men until justice has done its work. The just penalty for sin was extracted when Christ was our substitute and died for us on the cross. God doesn't just forget about our sins. Sin had to be paid for. There had to be punishment for sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The soul that sins, it shall die. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so then death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. But that is the reason Christ came. Christ is our Redeemer, paid the price for our sin. When he was hanging on that cross, Peter tells us that he was bearing in his body the sin of the whole world. Your sin and my sin, past, present, and future. And the result of him hanging on that cross and bearing our sin meant that he faced the holy wrath of God for us. That's why he could say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, God's justice says that sin must be paid for. Jesus Christ paid for it perfectly. And therefore, justice was satisfied. When I was driving to church this morning and I was listening to the radio and they, they played a song. Um, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted is the name of the song. And one of the lines in the song just like jumped out and slapped me in the face. Because in that song it says, 
many hands sought to destroy him, brought him to the place of the cross. But the blow that did the damage was the price of justice. Paying our way. So Paul says it's just just that he does it. Think about that for a moment. You say, I don't deserve the justice of God. You're right, you don't. Listen. One day we're all going to die unless the Lord comes back. Either way, if you're a believer in Christ, you're going to go to heaven. And I thought about that. You know, when you get to heaven and you stand before God's holy throne, God doesn't say, Ron Smith, this is your lucky day. You came at a good time. You know you don't deserve this. And I hope you know me letting you in here is not just. Because I like you, Ron, I'm going to bend the rules a little bit. Because that's just the kind of God I am. No! The only way Ron gets into heaven, I'm sorry to disappoint some of you, the people, but I know Ron, he's going to get there. The only way Ron gets to heaven was because justice was satisfied by the blood of Jesus Christ. And guess what? That's the only way we're going to get in, too. It is just. Did you go to the cross this morning before you came to church and think about what Christ has done for you? Every day we ought to go to the cross and remember the price that was paid so that we could be declared righteous and just before a holy God. That is the gospel, the good news that Christ died for sinners. And at this moment, we're going to stop and think about that. We're going to remember. The Apostle Paul says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whosoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and to drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge his body rightly. For this cause... Many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. 
But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Gathering allow the Lord's table in communion, taking of the elements, the bread, the juice, can never save you. There is no saving power in the elements whatsoever. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. And Paul says several times in this passage, do this in remembrance. Do this in remembrance. What are we to remember? Remember your salvation and the price that was paid. Remember that one day all of this is going to come to an end and God is going to make things right. Remember that Jesus Christ is coming to give us eternal rest. I want you to stand And we introduced a song back in September, and it's a great song. And we'll learn it over the next year, I hope. But it is called the communion song. And I want you to pay attention to the words as we sing them. Because this tells us why we are doing what we are doing. Behold the Lamb who bears our sin Slain for us And we remember The promise made toward all who come in faith Find forgiveness at the cross bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace around the table of the king the body of our savior jesus christ torn for you Eat and remember the wounds that heal the death that brings us life. Paid the price to make us one. So we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of That cleanses every stain of sin shed for you. Drink and remember, he drained death's cup. Enter in to receive the life of God. So we share the spread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of grace around the table of the King. And so with thankfulness and faith we rock to respond and to remember our call to follow the steps of Christ as his body here on earth. As we share in his suffering, we proclaim Christ will come again and will 
joy in the feast of heaven around the table of the king. With heads bowed and eyes closed, can we take a moment to reflect upon the words we have sung? What a great privilege we have to sit around the table of the king. Not as slaves or strangers. but as children of the King and brothers and sisters. Allow the Spirit to search your heart if there's animosity or anger, if there's bitterness. Don't come to the table with that. Come in love and forgiveness, even as we have been granted forgiveness by him. Lord, we thank you and we pray that as we gather around your table, we will remember what it is truly all about. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You should have received the communion set. I'm going to ask you to take the bread out. Jesus said, as he broke the bread, this is my body which was broken for you. Do in remembrance of me, Ichi. On the same night, he took the cup, said, my blood is the new covenant. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me, drinking. Let us not forget this week who we are in Christ, what we have been called to do. I'd like to remind you that uh, as we are dismissed, not to congregate inside here. I know we want a fellowship. I know we miss it, but we need to take it outside. We still need to sanitize after the service and get things cleaned up. Scripture says, when they were done, they sang a hymn. They went into the night. I think we're all familiar with, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood. Let's all stand. fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein and sinners plunged beneath that blood lose all their guilty stain all their guilty stains lose all Sinners plunge beneath 
that blood lose all their guilty stains. May the Lord bless and keep you. We are dismissed.